Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Maggie. And I'm Jillian. And this is the Fresh Squeezed Opera Podcast. And we have my longtime friend, Jane Hoffman, color to our soprano, with us today. And we're going to talk to her about her path as a singer as well as the different, the different forms of education she has experienced in her music career. And let's just go ahead and get started with that. So, Jane, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And um, maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about um, your path or how you first got into singing opera and where that took you. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I guess I would say... I, um, I started out first, the first thing that I was into was, uh, music in general, because when I was a kid, um, I was somewhat musically inclined. I liked to sing along to, um, Sesame Street tapes and, um, so my parents being, you know, being smart people thought, oh, maybe we should <laughs> out for that instead of just, uh, well, I was getting way away in the backseat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... So um, I, I started out I started out taking uh, piano lessons and um, singing in choirs and so I had always been interested in music um, and as I got older I think in about like middle school or high school um, I started getting interested in opera um, because uh, my my piano teacher exposed me to some. Um, classical vocal music and then also I have um, some family members who are very big fans of opera my aunt and uncle um, and they had bought me I think the, the first thing that I really that really got me into opera was they bought me a recording of La Boheme nice. with uh, Nicola Guetta and Morella Frady so that is like the uh, Cadillac of La Boheme <laughs> 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 Oh, and I think Roberta Peters is, is, uh, is that, it's like great. It's an amazing nice. thing. And it's nice of my own, but, and it was great because it was packaged with a little thing about the history of the opera, about the various singers and a full libretto. So there was one where I just sort of, you know, popped it in my little, you know, Walkman back in the day because I'm old and, um, listened to the whole thing. I was just like, so, so into it. I kind of feel like if you're a teenager, La Boheme, like, will completely speak to you because it is that level of everything is great or terrible, you know. <laughs> so, no so bohemian, so angsty, yes. Right, and yes. so that was when I started really getting into opera more than um, just choir or musical theater or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I wound up, for college, I actually, I auditioned at some conservatories um and then i decided to not go to them <laughs> I, I went to sarah lawrence instead which i think was actually a really good decision i had to like read books and write papers and do real stuff you know awesome. 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 really a good move like reading books is important and you should do it um that's what they keep telling me <laughs> my boyfriend works at the juilliard store and um he it's the sections for their required literature. It's like one shelf, and it's so sad. It's, it's so small. It's so, and it's awful. I mean, like, I don't know. I don't know. How, yeah. yeah. We can get into conservatories later and the education that yes, they provide. Let's, let's get into that later. Um, right, oh my god. <laughs> so... So, Sarah Lawrence, how did you how did you feel um, your experience of music at Sarah Lawrence was? Um, I actually I really liked it. I Sarah Lawrence obviously you know is a really really small school and has a a very small music department and it's kind of an eclectic mix of people because you have um, a lot of your know, kids are really into some, some weird compositional stuff like oh you know I'm I'm writing a piece that's all electronic music and tape and, you know, weird sounds I recorded by, you know, hitting a trash can with my friend's broken violin and that's, I'm mixing that into, diff you know, a bunch of different things and that is my piece of music. Um, and yep. like, and, and then people, like, they have like a gamelan ensemble, like it's very, like a weird, crazy mix of people, but that I think is good mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, 
especially when you're younger and starting out as a singer, like it's really nice to kind of be a big fish in a small pond. Um, and also be, I think, forced to be a little self-directed, you know, you, I sort of, they don't really have a very traditional music program. So a lot of the stuff I learned was because I said, oh, you know, I really like this one piece or I really like this one composer. So I'm going to work on a bunch of this stuff or work on this particular kind of music or this set of songs because it interests me Mm -hmm. and... I'm going to go and, you know, do all the research and find someone to play it with me and rehearse with them and do all this stuff myself. It's good to, I think, get that kind of experience as early as possible because that is how real life is. (laughs) Yes, yes. Especially, I'm sure you felt this once you were done with school, that sort of inner drive and self-directed motivation is probably crucial for I don't know, just, just directing yourself outside of a educational system. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's easy to get used to, um, grad school kind of maybe feel this way, get used to people just telling you, okay, and now you do this thing, and now you take that class, and you learn this piece, and you perform it, and you are done. Check. Mm-hmm. Which isn't really how life works. Um, and I think also doesn't really cultivate any kind of interesting music making because it's not about it's just checking boxes it's not about you exploring you know what is what is meaningful to me as a performer and artist what interests me what um you know attracts me what you know what challenges me mm-hmm. yeah so asking those questions about yourself rather than like what must i do to receive a degree <laughs> what box can i check off yes so at, at sarah lawrence what were some of those projects um if anything stands out anything that really sort of grabbed you early on yeah I um uh, I was really the other thing I was gonna say was also that people I think people at Sarah Lawrence by and large are are pretty interesting unusual people and that really does help um the one of the things was I wound up I met um a friend of mine who played the oboe randomly because the Sarah Lawrence music building was once someone's house that they donated to the school their mansion (laughs) and so um nothing is soundproof Oh, nice. <laughs> I mean, they try, but, you know, it's a house. It was built, like... Yeah, that's that's pretty much, like, Smith. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they put stuff on the walls. The music, the music uh, department was... The practice rooms were definitely not soundproof, which is why I always practiced on the top floor, because I didn't want <laughs> anyone to hear me. Uh, yeah, there was... I mean, there was, the, there was one kid who would... I don't know who this person was, and they would go to the second floor biggest practice room, which must have been, like, some kind of, like, living room or bedroom or something, because it had a fireplace in it. Nice. And it has a grand piano in it, and they would play the intro to Clocks. Just the intro, not the whole piece, just the intro. Clocks, I'm not familiar with this piece. It's a Coldplay song. Song. Oh, dear. Forever. I was like, I'm going to come in that practice room. That's why. Yeah, like, I would <laughs> ever be in your eye. But, uh, oh, man. Anyway, I, the point is that I met this friend of mine because we were practicing in two adjacent rooms, and he knocked on my door, and he was like, oh, I play um, the oboe, and he had started playing Baroque oboe, which is a, sort of a different thing, and he was like, oh, I want to do some music with oboe and soprano. There's tons of music written, particularly by Bach, for oboe and soprano. And I want to do some of that with someone. So do you want to do some of that with me? And I was like, sure, because I didn't really know anything about anything. Um, But it turns out that I really like Baroque music. Awesome. (laughs) And I really like singing it. And there was, like, just this crazy random happenstance that I happened to do some of it and then get into that because I, you know, met this one person and got interested in that. Same thing is that I, I wound up doing a bunch of um, music that other students wrote, which I, I don't think I would have done anywhere else just because, you know, I had friends who were in composition classes. I said, oh, you should write something for a singer because I sing and I would like to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That's kind yeah. of how, yeah, Jillian and I worked together. Yeah. Right? That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's your after you left college? What did you do? Um, after.
after I graduated from Sarah Lawrence, I went straight to grad school um, to Manhattan School of Music, which I like actually. <laughs> I feel so weird telling other singers this, but, like, in retrospect, I think if you're a young singer now, you should probably wait a year or two before you go to grad school, especially because now it's very, it's even more competitive than it was before. And it was already pretty competitive to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, right. <laughs> which is crazy. But, um, yeah, and which, like, I think because it was so different than Sarah Lawrence is, was in also a, a, a lot of ways very helpful because Manhattan School of Music is a very big school with a lot of singers and that is kind of more of a taste of the real world of singing in the sense that you know, there are a lot of us and if you ever thought that like, oh I'm irreplaceable and I'm the only person who does this one thing, you are not the only person. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it is a big pond out there. It really is. Um, so back to taking a taking a year off. Uh, what prompts you to to believe that today young singers might benefit from a break between uh, bachelors and masters? Um, I think uh, because now um, the masters program is important for singers in the sense that it's a good way to make some connections, network a bit, um, and ideally, you know, get a nice fancy name on your resume with some nice fancy performing credits um which sounds kind of like but isn't it going to school and isn't that not what school is about at all i would say yes you are correct that's not what school should be about at all but that's what it is about right now i think it depends like, on the school i mean what it depends on the school because where i am like so I agree with you with you should take at least a year off between bachelor's and business school because I'm sorry, <laughs> bachelor's and grad school because I applied to music theory programs because I was a theory emphasis in college and I got, um, what's the word? Like they, I got in with the stipulation that I would take a year off from the two places I applied and they said that I just needed some real world experience. And the way it would work is I would apply again, and they would automatically admit me. But I'd have to apply again to let them know I wanted to do it. And um, I took a year off, and I realized that maybe music theory wasn't the career I wanted. And it's not lucrative, and there's no jobs. And I didn't want to go to Chicago. <laughs> so I... I didn't I didn't know you didn't want to go to Chicago. Yeah, because I got into the Northwestern uh, Music Theory and Cognition Program, which admits three people. <laughs> so it, it, You made some fourth person so happy. I yeah, know. Damn. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, but I didn't get in yet. I, I got in with the stipulation I had to take at least a year off. And um, so after I took a year off, I was like, I want to grow myself into a person who can really add to the music community. So I ended up going to business school instead and I'm in business school now. And I mean, I think in any field, I think you should take a year off because you just don't know. And being out in the real world is, and I know this is so like in college, people say this to, to you all the time, you know, that it's so different and it's so hard and you just don't know, but it is. It's, it's true. and it's much harder, even though the stress isn't necessarily the same, and the stress is probably more in college. Um, it's different. It's lonely. It's you don't have that support group anymore. It's true. Yeah, I think it's, it's true. It's so it's valuable experience. I think is what you're both saying is that there is an opportunity to to learn and grow outside of school, and then. Going to going back to school can bring, I don't know, maybe you bring new perspective to education. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I also think that like that's part of the the thing that is difficult is that undergrad is is a bit different in that it's still sort of and you know easing you into adult life. The problem is that grad school is much more. I think students don't understand that when you apply to grad school, you need to be. Focusing not on, you know, oh, and I'll go to a place and it'll be great. You need to focus on what does this program offer to me? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you need to be, I feel like you need to think of it like you're dating someone to marry them. Do you want to marry this person? Like, you're going to spend two years with this person. Do you even like them? Do yeah. they like you? Do they really want you really bad? Is this going to pan out right. over over a course of time? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's very <laughs> important. Is there safety option? I don't think there's safety option. Be a person that they really want in their program. And for singers, that's difficult because schools depend on having, a lot of schools depend on having singers to, quite frankly, pay the bills. Really? Yeah. That's, I, it's not, that's not a pleasant thing to think yeah. about, but you need, you need to know if you're a singer applying to grad school, but that is the truth. Especially if you are not like, you know, oh my God, magically a dramatic tenor at age 23. <laughs> In which case, good for you. But we've kind of covered the difference between your experience of liberal arts college versus uh, Manhattan School of Music. Um, was there anything else, Jane, that sort of sums up the difference between those two systems of education for you? I think, yeah, I think the one thing I would say is that particularly in a um, performance degree in a conservatory, um, when it comes to the master's level for singers, you should know going into it that it is somewhat pre-professional. Um, and that's a double-edged sword. I mean, on the one hand, that can be a negative for someone, but I think in some ways it, it has to be a bit pre-professional. It is the point at which, you know, uh, push is coming to shove. You know, do you want to do this on a professional level? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Yes, it's it is in a way like a test to of your real level of interest and dedication, and so um, I think the more people know that going in and prepare for it in that way, the better. That's one of the reasons I think I think it would be a good idea to take time off, just because then you have a chance to really sort yourself out technically, mm -hmm. um, which is so important, and then. Um, then you'll be better equipped to um, make the most of your grad school experience. That's just my my personal. Yes. You know, your mileage may vary. I think I I reached out to you when I first started going to Smith, and we talked about um, you know, is a liberal arts education a good foundation for a performance career? And would you say that? Um, you, do you have any regret? Do you have any wish that you've gone straight onto a conservatory, or would you would you still say that a liberal arts education was a good first step? Oh my God, I have absolutely no wish that I had gone to a conservatory for undergrad. <laughs> Negative wishes. <laughs> like, I, uh, I can't even. There are no words to describe how much I do not wish that. Um, mostly because, you know, first of all, I, I kind of feel like when you're 18, you might think that you want to do one thing, but you definitely could change your mind. Um, you really could. You probably will. Yeah. That's fine. I was, That's a, it. I was pre-med. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be an OBGYN and, uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, people do that all the time. And I, the problem is... You know, I remember being that age, and you're like, oh, you don't know anything, old person. Uh, I'm going to do this thing I'm going to do. Oh, my. You but, know? <laughs> I mean, so we were talking about this in my class the other day because the way business school works is you study off of case studies, and um, so you analyze a situation that's really detailed about somebody trying to start a business or whatever, and the one that we were looking at was a series of partners, and one of them had a liberal arts education, the other one had an engineering degree from MIT, and we were basically just analyzing who was more, you know, more set to run the business, and everyone, for the most part, was looking at the guy from MIT, and I was the only one who valued the liberal arts degree because, I mean, you, you're forced to, to take classes in a lot of different fields, and you're you're forced to spend a lot of time with pe different people from different fields and different interests, and you learn through that. Like one of my friends was an ASL major, and she was deaf, 
and I know a little ASL from that, but I know actually a lot about the deaf community and the culture behind it because I spent a lot of time with her. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I also think that, um, especially in our day and age, the ability to write well and yeah. concisely and clearly really can't be overvalued. From a purely musical perspective, the thing I think of is, you know, I don't have an agent. I made my own resume and bio. <laughs> I have to write my own, you know, email queries to companies or whatever. Like, I do that all myself. And that's on me. <laughs> I don't want to write a professional email that sounds like I'm a seventh grader. Um as well as the fact that, you know, all the stuff that I am singing is based on a lot of classical literature, mostly. So, sort of behooves you to have read that and analyzed that, I think. Yeah, and, you know, I think then also I'm maybe more qualified to do other things, which most singers have to do to pay the bills, so. I would love to hear your impressions, Jane, uh, about the recent... Spanish production of Brokeback Mountain, the opera. I know you watched, did you watch the whole thing? Did you watch a little bit of it? I watched a little bit um, because it was being streamed while I was at my day job. Um, and it's obviously rather not safe for work in content. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, you know that. Um, and so I watched a bit of it when it was still um, posted online on um uh, Medici.tv or whatever it is. Um, and I, I really enjoy it. Like, I really like the idea of basing an opera on that story. It seems, I mean, you know, how many operas are there about forbidden love? A thousand. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that and I just, I don't know, like, I feel like should write operas based on stories that are, like, modern and contemporary. It doesn't always have to be about, like, dead people. Like, come on, guys. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I liked it. Like, um, the composer, whose name I am blanking on because I'm an idiot. Hold on, I've got it right here. Uh, okay. Charles Warrenen. Yes, Charles Warrenen. Um, I, like, his music isn't always my bag, just, like, as a taste thing. But um, I definitely liked a lot of it, and I just I just thought it was a really inspired idea. And then also it helps that the singers were great. So that is always a plus. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I think I think your your point is very good about modernizing opera, and I think it is it's rather exciting that they they chose to do this. Um, I actually read recently that the the director, the stage director, just passed away. And um, he was known for being a very creative, sort of very risk-taking kind of opera director. So, oh yeah, it was um, was it the director? It was the guy who um, he commissioned the idea. He was going to run. Um, it was Gerard Mortier who passed away yes. from cancer. Yes. Yes. He also commissioned the um, the opera about Disney. Oh. Is there an opera about Disney? Uh, yes. Oh, my God. I'm going to Google it and tell you what it was called. I'm going to beat you. Oh, my God. Oh my Googling God. race. Walt Disney. Oh, it's by Philip Glass. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> perfect American, something like that. Um, perfect American. That's what it's called. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. Final, explores the final days in the life of Walt Disney. Yeah, but probably not really. You know, it's probably, like, super pretentious and ununderstandable. Wait. <laughs> you know? Are you not a Philip Glass fan? No. I'm not. <laughs> uh, yes, the truth comes out. The oh truth my comes gosh. out. I still think that's, that's good subject matter, though. It Walt, is. Walt Disney was of the same grand, grandiose nature. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, yeah, I, you, I, I definitely mean, just... But, like, how did they portray him? You know, did they make him the chauvinistic anti-Semite drunk he was, or did they make him the Mickey Mouse creator? <laughs> I don't know, because they did not 
I don't know. I don't think they streamed that. I don't think it's... that you would be able to understand even if you did. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying I saw the first two thirds of Satya Graha and I, it was just, it was awful. It was, I walked yeah. out and we had I'm, literally I'm... front row seats at the Met and I walked out. <laughs> like we were so close. We could see the cues of the libretto. Oh, man. It was really cool. Except for that for Philip Glass, it didn't change because it was the same freaking words over and over again. I that sh- is kind of his thing. I that shit you funny. not. There was this part where they were just going, ha, 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 And the cue <laughs> thing just said, ha. Like, you would forget. <laughs> I feel like... I, whenever I see, because I'm not like a huge Philip Glass fan, although I do enjoy like minimalism, I enjoy, but I just I can't really get too into Philip Glass, mostly because all I can think about is the poor singers having to memorize the like weird, small, repeating, fragmented things that go on and on. And on. Like, in in languages like, that don't exist. I know it seems like memor like just memorization suicide. Like. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just shouting that you don't care if the audience understands you if you write it in ancient Egyptian or Sanskrit. Sanskrit. Yeah. 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 It's not it's not really for me. I think I also feel like there are other. I don't know. Philip Glass to me, he is the he is the Tim Burton of the music world because Tim Burton used to be he used to do really striking films. But now he's just kind of a caricature of himself, and everyone finds his movies really <laughs> funnily stupid. You know, it's like the same thing over and over again, and that's, a, that's what Phil Glass is. He's just a, he just does this. Like, and I don't mean, like, because it's minimalism. I mean, Akhenaten is basically the same thing as Satyagraha. Right, like, that does become a problem when you're like, this is the same opera. Yeah, What's but happening? you can look at John Adams and, you know, Nixon in China is way different than the death of Klinghoffer or something. Oh, yeah. Which okay, I'm, and I also am, like, totally an Adams fan, so. Yeah, and I'm just like to see that next next season at the Met. They're doing that. Yeah. Yes, me too. It's, like, the only interesting thing they're doing. I'm pretty excited. They're okay, doing, no, Bluebeard is also interesting. They're doing D. Meister Singer, actually. Yeah, I could not. I, I six hours. I like Wagner, but I don't really like Meisterzinger. I so, so it was really so. I took German at Smith, and I went abroad to Austria. And after I so my senior year, um, it's like pretty known in my class that I'm a music person and I love Wagner. And my teacher was like, "Oh, you like Wagner? So you do a paper on Der Meistersinger? You do a one page paper on Der Meistersinger?" I'm like, um. But it's a really long opera. It's a lot of work. And I did. I don't know how you condense that down into one page. Like, the well, she, summary is She one really page just, like, we were talking idea. about, we were talking about, um, industry in Germany. That was what the class was about. And she wanted to know about Hans Sachs, who's, like, a, you know, he was big in industry and. Right, right. Shoemaker. <laughs> shit like that. <laughs> I'm just imagining you trying to write one page about Meister Singer, which is like six hours long. Yeah. Right. But it's possible. And it's supposed to be his comedy. It's not funny. <laughs> I, I, I the closest Wagner can come to comedy, though. That's not true. There's a really funny part in Siegfried. There's one really funny moment in Siegfried when when he. I'm sorry, I'm a Wagner nut. I am like. <laughs> I listen to him daily. <laughs> I've seen the ring cycle four times. I own the ring cycle. Oh my god, four yeah. times? I've, seen, I've stood through them. All, yeah. I'm impressed. And, um, but like, there's that part in Siegfried, you know, where he is trying to mimic the bird before he realizes he has his horn. He tries to make a reed instrument. And then, like, an English horn plays a really doofy kind of thing backstage. And it's, it's kind of funny. I don't know. See, I'm always thinking of that part in what, what, where is it Valkyrie or is it Siegfried where he discovers um, 
he discovers Brunhilde and he like goes to like look at her and he's like, Das ist kein Mann. And you're like, yeah, dude, we know. <laughs> no, you don't say. Well, Jane, it would have to be Siegfried because Siegfried isn't in Die Valkyrie and Brunhilde <laughs> isn't asleep in Die Valkyrie. <laughs> oh. God, Jane. God. <laughs> oh, could you not know? <laughs> I started reading his his autobiography, which is 800 pages long with no chapters, no no breaks, nothing, just straight prose. Yeah. And it is I only got to like 200 pages in, and I later found out that he didn't actually write it; he just dictated to Cosima, and she just wrote it down. And he, oh yeah, I know what it. What and it, they didn't even bother to like edit it at all. It seems. It well, they they. I mean, obviously, was, I was reading it in English. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. And <laughs> and um, he. It's just like he builds himself up, like from the beginning. Like he he actually got to meet a lot of cool people when he was when he was young, and I believe that he did. Like, um, Comrie von Weber, like, came to visit his home a lot. But the way that he talks about how they treated him when he was a kid is, like, they knew I was a genius, and so they helped me out with this, this, and this. And I'm like, no. Uh, well, it's like, you know, it's like Wagner and, you know, like, List, who, you know, List did nothing but champion what a genius Wagner was and loaned him a ton of money. And produced a bunch of his pieces. Well, and then Wagner would always be like, oh, list compositions are second rate. Yeah, well, like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, and well. he did the the best to this day, list did the best tra- piano transcriptions of his operas. <laughs> it's hilarious. If you, if you go wow. and you want a tra- piano transcription, that's not necessarily playable, but is encompasses the opera and the music very well, you will get the list one. <laughs> That's really sad that Bogner did not return the. He did. He took his yard. like stepdaughter off of his hands. I mean, like I, I feel like Bogner is one of those great examples of like you can be a total genius and also a complete asshole. Yeah, like yeah. just an unrelenting asshole. But people only say that about Wagner because he was an anti-Semite. But Beethoven was the same way. But people don't say it because he was. Super, super sexist and a chauvinist. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, him and a lot of other people. I just think Wagner's like a special. But you could say artist. that. But you could say that about Wagner too. It's Wagner and a lot of other people mm. that mm. were anti semites at the time because it was a trend. It was. I can't. I can't disprove or argue with that point. <laughs> I think that was. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. So we've covered everything from education to anti-Semitism. Uh, and Vagi McVagenstein. And what? Vagenstein? Vagi McVagenstein. Vagi McVagenstein. Vagi McVagenstein. Vagi McVagenstein. That's excellent. Jillian, do you have any more questions for Jane? I uh, know. So... Our regular question in this podcast is of my own creation, and I will now ask you, Jane, what is on your iPod? Oh, um, well, I recently went and got a new iPod, one of the ones that holds like a jillion gigs of music. (laughs) Wait, you got, you just got an iPod? Yes. But do you not have like an iPhone or a smartphone? Oh, yeah. Oh, I have an iPhone. The problem is, is that I have, like, 30 gigs of music. Which is, like, twice the total capacity of my iPhone, right? Yeah, but you pick and choose, you know? You pick and choose. Oh, my God, no. People always say, the guys at the freaking Apple store were like, well, you can pick and choose and get this little shiny thin one. And I was like, listen, dude, I want it all there (laughs) in the thing. (laughs) Every time I go on the subway, all the time. Wow. 
I all right, so this is going to be the longest response to this question ever. List all of them. My <laughs> <laughs> we well, what here. are you? What are you currently listening to? Um. Okay. Well, I am kind of a nerd, and so right now I'm listening to a recording of um Hansel and Gretel that I just bought. Oh, nice. But um, I my iPod is pretty. I guess it's pretty diverse. I have things like the other things I recently listened to were. Let's look here. Playlist recently played. Um, I recently got the um, original cast recording of um, I Was Looking at the Ceiling and Then I Saw the Sky by John Adams, which is amazing. Um, and it's great, and it has Audrey McDonald talking about uh, the curly hair leading down to some dude's belly button and like, listen to it. It's <laughs> fantastic. Um, and then I have, I'm also really, <laughs> really a big fan of rap. A lot of people are not into that, but I totally am. What do you listen to? Oh my god. Um, I'm a big fan of Lupe Fiasco. Me I too. love Kanye West. I'm like a 100% Kanye West is an inspiration kind of person. <laughs> For real? Yes. No, you know what? Especially because I think if you're a singer, like, you go through a lot of experiences where people are like, well, you need to fix this and this and this, and also your dress is ugly. Like... <laughs> There, you go through a lot of, like, criticism, so sometimes you need to have a little, you know, moment of, like, what would Kanye West do? Mm-hmm. Kanye West would say, I'm a genius, I'm an artist, and I'm expressing my art, and everyone else can go fuck themselves. That's a really good point. <laughs> That's an excellent point, and, and what better what better way? I have always said, although I don't particularly like his music, I have always said that the world is a better place because Kanye West lives in it. He's fantastic. I also yeah, that. I love that. I'm, I'm a big fan, and I think he's a very good rapper and an excellent producer. Um, I feel like my my like, person, okay. my inspiration is Britney. I'm a, I'm a huge Britney Spears fan. I've always been. I wrote a fan letter to her when I was in high school because I lost 10 pounds only listening and working out to her music. And I was like, Britney's getting a lot of flack these days, so I'm going to write her a really nice letter. <laughs> and I also have some Britney here. What else have I got? Oh, my God. A big, big Tori Amos fan. <laughs> uh, you know, like, that was that was the age I, I came. I grew yeah. up in. It was yeah. Angry women, pianos. <laughs> really into that. Uh, what else is in here? A bunch of random this, that, and the other. Right. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, at, at some point, when one acquires, uh, let me see, 23 days, 7 hours, 14 minutes, and 6 seconds of music, there's a lot of different stuff in yeah. there. Although, how, like, what percentage of that do you think is opera? Because those are long. They take up a lot of space. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, it takes actually, a lot of time. I think it's probably, it's probably less than half, actually. Right. Because um, I try to be kind of particular about what I really want to hang on to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like, do I need another recording of, like... The Turn of the Screw. I have, like, four recordings of that. Like, no, I don't. There's one that I have that's not even, like, I don't even like. I don't even know why I own it. <laughs> that's why I miss, I miss going to college, a college with a good music library, because I just rented out all the CDs and just burned them onto my computer. Oh, my God. That is literally what I do at the Lincoln Center Music Library. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> oh, God. I've stolen so much music from them. I mean, you know, not stolen CDs, but, like, burned them. Right, yeah. I give back the CDs because I'm not, you know, a complete piece of shit. I mean, come on. What? Who steals the CD? What? Like, I'm Jillian. And this is the Fresh Squeezed Opera Podcast with special guest Jane Hoffman.